Hey everyone, welcome to KidSpot's Facebook Live with the fabulous Maggie Dent. Hi Maggie. Hello. <laughs> so just for those, you know, few people who might not know Maggie, she is a fantastic parenting author and the mum of four boys, which makes her very qualified to be talking about our topic today, which is Raising Good Boys. She has a new book out. It's called From Boys to Men. And we are super excited to get some no-nonsense advice from the queen of parenting, Maggie herself. Maggie, how are you tonight? Hey, look, I'm, I'm really fabulous and just love this opportunity, Mel, to be able to chat, especially in a kind of informal way about um, my passion, which is um, I've been a boy champion for a long time, but I also like girls, <laughs> just in case. Good, good to know. Good. Sometimes I'm not so sure, so that's good. <laughs> No, seriously, I have got four granddaughters and I'm learning so much. And then the other thing is, let's put the disclaimer out there that statistically significant number of boys are in this kind of cohort when I talk about boys. But there are some girls that have some of our, you know, I was a little bit boy-like as a child, as a girl. I just didn't have a penis and I didn't get surges of testosterone. So, so every now and then just take what may work if you've got a girl. And if not, it's definitely most of our little boys. Excellent. Now, speaking of little boys, I got home tonight and I had to navigate a row of Lightning McQueen cars and then Ushies and could hardly get to my kitchen. But he has just turned five and is the most affectionate, loving, gorgeous little creature. But so many mums tell me this doesn't last. So what happens to their little brains between this gorgeous little squishy thing at five as they enter into tweendom. <laughs> okay, so there is a small percentage of gorgeous boys who don't transform into monosyllabic monsters, who are still warm and I've got, so I've got one out of four who um, just remained, you know, quite sweet, even though really forgetful. Okay, so what happens, and it's kind of like um, you can have this lovely relationship, you know, for boys, it, seven, eight, nine, or eight can be a wobbly year for a lot of other reasons, nine, ten, and, and you know, you can chat to them and they can probably unload the dishwasher with only being asked once or twice, and then all of a sudden something changes and you'll feel them withdraw and, and like a wall go up and some mums email me and say, well, I think someone's stolen my son and they've just replaced him with an alien. And yeah. so what actually does happen is these poor, beautiful boys have no idea they're just about to get hit by the adolescent truck of change. So the first thing often happens around 10, you get a bit of sass, you know, a bit of attitude. So that's the hormonal changes. So he doesn't wake up going, hmm, let me be a bit sassy. No, mm. all of a sudden a bit more testosterone, you know, a bit more angst. And then, of course, you've got the physical changes after that, but it's the brain changes that really transform our beautiful boys and make them kind of look down a lot and feel like, yeah, a bit more like they they don't like themselves. I mean, I can remember that as a girl, but with a boy, he's also got massive growth spurts. He's got a badly behaved penis. He's got zits. He's got hair growing, it, it, all sorts of stuff going on at the same time that all of this. So guess what? He runs a lot of stress. He's actually confused. And when people tell him to speak more clearly or tell him to remember stuff, he then attacks himself even a bit more. So at the end mm. of it, a lot of it is to do with big, ugly feelings that he's unable to necessarily identify or manage or share because, of course, the man box is still kind of conditioning them. You're supposed to be stoic and tough. You don't own those vulnerable feelings. So it's a combination of all that rolled in together, Mel, that makes it a bit tricky for them. And so does that kind of manifest itself in a lot of self-shame? Because even though my son's already five, occasionally I have seen him do the, I'm just a stupid boy. If, you know, if you pull him up on something that might not be right, is, is that quite common behaviour for that age group? Yeah, and I, if I can decode where that comes from, this is really, really helpful. So what we've noticed, um, and this is Michael Gurian, um, one of the leading experts in the world who, who, who helped me identify, he had it in one of his books, and the more I pondered on the real this is exactly it boys and men tend to need an external experience or an external event which with the, they kind of test themselves and if they do well then they give themselves self-worth 
So as females, what we tend to be doing, we tend to be, oh my gosh, every single thought and feeling we're analysing and our behaviours, we're constantly doing it internalising. They're looking out there. And one of the stories I often share you know, when I was allowed to speak to real humans um, was the one about um, if a boy has decided he wants to build his Duplo blocks up to a really high level and uh, all of a sudden it's time to go to school and mummy's come in and say, quick, get all that, pack it all away. You, you know, it's time to go. And what's happened is he's just been ripped off because he didn't quite get to do it up to where he'd wanted. So he can't give himself a sense of self-worth. And sometimes they can get really crabby then. And it's not about getting in the car. It's about having an experience um, sabotaged by us. So there's one line for all the parents out there. Every now and then check with your boy. If you haven't finished it to where you want to yet, you can come back and do it after daycare, after school. Trust me, that is gold. Life changing. Yeah. yeah. And, and is it, are we, you know, in that instance, is it that we're overloading them as parents with too many instructions? So you say, put, put your Lego away, get your shoes on. I mean, I'm guilty of this this morning. I was like, hurry up, brush your teeth, get your shoes on, get your bag. Yeah. Where's your socks? You know, where's your drink bottle? And I mean, if someone spoke to me like that, I'd probably be like, whoa. Yeah. Okay. But we do, you know, we're in a hurry, we're in a rush. And we're like, yeah. go, 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 go. And what many mummies identify quite early is girls have got much better memories. Sarah said they just remember everything. And, and um, women, let's and, be honest. Yeah, women, well, we, we, don't you reckon, Mel, we can remember stuff we haven't even happened, but we're sure that Oh, happen. yeah. Um, we will never forget. We will never forget. And so this is that other place where you can recognise that your son, whether he's four or he's 14, does not deliberately forget stuff, that he actually struggles to remember stuff that he's A, not interested in, or B, he's not focused in. So the single focus is another one of these key things where um, we can get confused about that. So if he's focused on building that Duplo right now and you yell it, call out for him and tell him it's dinner time, he actually often, it looks like he's deliberately not listening. He actually can't hear you because he doesn't have as an effective brain as we do. And he's, he's actually completely absorbed in this. So when we can recognise that, we do, that's why we get to what you've just talked about. We have to endlessly keep on, you know, and one of my beautiful daughter and also our oldest little grandson, um, she, she's just exasperated. He's uh, four and a half, uh, no, just over four. And to get him dressed, to get to daycare, oh, she's, you know, like he's just, he's just hanging around like a lob. There's oh, a few reasons why they do that, and that's that they prefer not to be dressed. Boys absolutely love their body, love to be naked, don't want to wear undies. No one. Oh yeah, undies. I can't get undies on my son right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's totally. Yeah. And, and again, there's a reason for that because we don't have external genitalia, so undies don't allow it all to be a little fleet freer. And also, they do love to keep on checking it's okay, and um, they soothe themselves with it. You know, well, we don't do that as girls, so you can see we get really frustrated at times without seeing how it is through the lens of our boys. And at different times, if you just rub your boys back and pat on the head when you want a hat on him, you can save the words. You know, if you can connect before you then kind of, when I say redirect, uh, and do a gentle reminder instead of the endless nagging, because what tends to happen, and it, we're all trying to get, you know, we're all trying to do the best we can and we're trying to get all our kids to get sorted and everything. Um, and I guess it's one thing I've learned now that I've got grand- granddaughters. I've got one that's five. That's that little boy's sister. So when we've got them at their house, um, Miss Ellie, well, my goodness, she just knows where everything is in the house. No, that doesn't go there, Nanny. That goes over there. And you've got to put that in the recycle over there. And so she's like a grown-up at five. And here's, here's little brother who's only 18 months younger, just doing turbo leaps off the couch, stark naked, um, yes, he does want to go. To this day. sounds like my house. Yeah. Um, running in and doing um, pop offs and farts in front of me, and then coming up to me and just saying, I love you, Nanny. I love you. <laughs> and Maggie, then- I just have to pull you up for a sec because you told me not to ask you about farting, and you brought it up. I just want that down in the record oh, that you were the one that brought, brought up farts. So, yeah, you're right. But it, we, <laughs> it's one of those things again that every now and then some of our boys' behavior including that particular aspect, but also being silly or jumping is because they've got too much cortisol or stress in them and they want to discharge it to make themselves feel good. So they're hunting dopamine, which is the fun one. Yeah, and, of course, the testosterone even as a little boy, but even more as a 13 and 14-year-old boy, 
and they have a few other brain changes, which means they love to test themselves, that they will do incredibly ridiculous things and often hurt themselves, you know. And, you know, I, I do remember chatting to a mum at one point who brought her son with us when I was counselling full time and he was 14, brought him to me with his um, <laughs> plaster on his arm. She said, you have to just tell him how stupid he is because this is the second time he's broken that arm. Anyway, and I've just thought, well, I'll just wait till the boy comes in. And, um, you know, when we were in the, in the I'm, I'm just so safe for boys. They just open up and he says, oh, I feel like a real idiot. Why would I do that? And I said, what were you trying to do? And he said, oh, I thought it'd be a really good idea to jump on the trampoline and jump over the neighbour's fence. You know, I could see how high I could go. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and, and he already has broken his arm doing it. And like three months later, he tries it again because he thought maybe if I did it better. Now, can you see what he's doing? He's actually testing. Yeah. Guess what? Yeah. That age group, so many of our boys are starting to step onto the bridge to manhood and are wanting to test themselves. But, of course, we've stolen traditional boyhoods, which let you have large, long monkey bars and wooden seesaws that punched you in the face and, mm -hmm. and a lot of freedom. So they're somehow or other getting over this bridge less capable because they've had less opportunities and I say this with great love to have a natural consequence that hurt mm. you know we can say a thousand times uh, no please don't do that because you could hurt yourself but you know what until he's hurt himself from his mm. choice it often doesn't go into the brain so yeah. like I say, every now and then if you've got those precious boys um you know we have to live with white knuckles sometimes don't that. And so is that is that a lesson, I guess, that we need to take then to, because it is an instinct and I know it's something I try not to do with my daughter around the, you know, if she's up a tree not saying, well, you might fall out, where well, I probably wouldn't say that to my son. So it is a quite an effort to be like, just, just let them go. And if they do fall out of that tree, then they will learn next time that that branch is not strong enough. And, and is that kind of something we need to start Obviously, we don't want our three-year-olds to fall out of a tree or to be going jumping over the fence with a trampoline. But but how do we, I guess, as parents, help them start to try and make better decisions uh, okay. when they're entering that, that what, stage? What we, what we do know is that our children are actually born with an ability to tap into their own um, warning systems, their inner warning systems. They actually already know how far they can go. And so... Um, that Miss Ellie, who's a very gentle, beautiful, well-behaved lamb kind of, but very feisty, threw herself out of a cot at uh, 14 months of age with a, a sleeping bag on. Um, and from she's got strong upper body strength. So at 18 months, we're, you know, in our local community, there's a really, really high one of those climbing things. And there she is on her way up there. And there are people calling out, Some, someone needs to get that girl down. That's too high for her. So can you see again? So she, it's mm. not because this is something she has innately in her. So instead of calling out, are you feeling safe? Because what you do is you interrupt her natural mechanism. So you may see an older child only go a few bits up and the leg will go, yeah, okay, that's enough today. So they stretch themselves to the edge of their own fear when we don't mess it up. Mm -hmm. And I have one of my boys, my number two, who's a beautiful lamb. So he's a very sensitive and he's not a, you know, alpha male out there banging his chest on everything. Oh, my gosh, he's the tree climber. And I can still remember watching him and I'm just, I've got to go at the other end of the house and I just take a cup of tea and sit up in a bedroom because every fibre of my being wants to rip him out of the tree. Mm. He is still a bit of a tree climber. He's also the one that takes the biggest waves when surfing. So every now and then, you know, our capacity, our job as parents is to allow, yeah, allow and trust um, without our fear getting into our kids' heads. And no, it's mm. not easy. Trust me, white knuckles is not easy. Um, and the other thing too, I love it, you touched on that a moment ago, is so what's happening is, you know, it's a gender shifting at either end and that is that, you know, a, a very simple example is if a little girl falls over, we actually often speak very differently to her. We'll lean down and go, well, you all right, sweetheart? Do you need a help or hand? Whereas if a boy falls over, we'll go, come on, get up. So what we've got to do is basically not pretend that our girls are weaker and our boys are tougher. What we do is we go, hey, oh, wow, are you okay? Do you need a growing up's help? Without any of the that that's where the social conditioning gets mm. kind of like around our kids accidentally. And mm. I do remember the really 
you know, in like challenging moments. I was in an early childhood setting and a little boy had fallen on the truck. He would have been around four. So he's not like a two year old. And he's hurt his he's hurt his knee and he was crying. He was really sobbing. And um, um, I noticed that kind of there wasn't an educator that came nearby at that point. I was really busting to go over, but I didn't know him. So it wasn't kind of appropriate. And then this one walked past and she just said, would you need to stop all that sniveling? And, oh, and I, you know, everything in me was wanting. Ah. And then she said, because if you don't, you can go and stand in the corner. So what's oh. happened? Is him being in pain has been um, shut down, which is exactly the old man box. Mm -hmm. Second, now shamed a boy expressing his vulnerable feelings about physically hurting himself. So, again, we've made him wrong. We've made what accident he had as though it was his fault. So you can see it doesn't sound much, but inside our boys' minds, and this is what kind of came up when I was, um, you know, some of my conversations with men on both of my books and the surveys was, how they've never shared something that happened to them when they were a little boy or a, a, a primary age boy, never shared it with the woman they loved that they've been married to for 35 years. And we, I think it was on one of the podcasts with Sarah Konoski on conversations um, and they were in the car and he started to cry. There were a number of men who sent their messages through because it was just like touching them deeply. And when they spoke to their beloved partner, the reason they didn't tell them this thing was because a part of them had been conditioned to believe you wouldn't be able to love me because they had been shamed for making a poor choice. This is what comes out in adolescence oh. if it's been suppressed. So can you see? Yeah. The golden window is as our little boys are younger. Yes, they will make more mistakes because they're much more impulsive. They're also biologically wired to move their bodies a lot more than most of us girls. Um, they're wired to have a go. They're wired to see if they can jump further or do something, you know. All of those things are natural wirings, but it's how it's interpreted by those around us. And that is, Mel, the golden window, which is, you know, why mothering our boys was so, so powerful because us females see the world through a female lens. Mm. And unless you have brothers, um, um, then you may you kind of might just think you're a bit weird. And I keep running into people, mums particularly, but mums and dads who now not only understand their boys better, but are getting on better. And it's so often after that Mothering Our Boys uh, seminar when a mum and a dad have come along that <laughs> I get the email from the dad, you know, going, oh, I was dragged along, you know, I don't like going to parent seminars. And <laughs> wow, I just learned about myself. And I now can say to my wife, babe, will you send me a text to remind me? Because you know I often forget without any shame. So in other words, we've got the memory. Help me to remember the things that really matter because I want to be a good partner. I want to be a good dad. But I sometimes get derailed because of my single focus in my brain. Yeah, wow. So, so it's really not that, you know, this mistaken belief that men are less emotional than women it's there it's just that we're unknowingly kind of parenting it out of them because we've been conditioned from our parents and our you know wider village to think that way it, it was really um they feel exactly as intensely but of course if we don't give them a lot of emotional coaching in those early years they're not quite sure what that big feeling is and then there's another thing that happens to them. So helping them to coach them about, you know, particularly like three and four year old boys who will do a lot of uh, pushing and shoving and kicking and and stuff, especially when they're frustrated and often they're frustrated about something. They're not sure why they're frustrated. So there will be an unmet need for that boy in that moment that he has no idea what it is. Yeah. Um, and our girls are way more savvy at working that stuff out. Um, but also down the track, what we now know is that when our limbic brain fires up, which is our, you know, that's our amygdala, that's our, and we get upset, um, they can now show in um, brain imaging that the next area to fire up in us as females is our word centre. <laughs> How often do we just go, funny that. <laughs> yep. And we have a man or a boy going, whoa. Yeah, what have what I done right now? Yeah. What have I done wrong now? So what happens for boys and men, it goes limbic brain, then the brain fires into the body. So can you see why sometimes that is why they'll do a kick or a shove 
Um, and we often see that as um, aggressive behaviour as well. And it doesn't come up into the word centre till quite a bit of time later. So again, when I, you know, taught mummies particularly to know that when there's a red room moment for our boys or our, you know, girls, you can talk to a girl probably pretty soon after it's happened and work out what's going on. For a boy, what you'll do is often trigger them into feeling even more um, stupid or ridiculous because they're, they're unable to process it but they want to process it. So it goes into the body. Yep. And then, you know, if you can get them outside, take them for a walk, jump them up and down, do something with them, you might be able to talk to them a bit early, but it's usually about 24 hours later. And if yeah, we can- Yeah, right, that long. Gosh. Yeah, if we can trust that, then what often happens, and when you, you've got to choose that, how do I talk to them? So it's often bath time. It's no interrogation after school because I- Or in the car. Yeah. And, yeah. No idea what happened after school. Um, and so what happens if you can say, to, can you remember what happened yesterday when you got really cross with your sister? If it's that amount of time and you've got this lovely, gentle voice, then he'll, he will often be able to talk about it. Or sometimes they will even come to you and say, mummy, I'm sorry, I kicked you yesterday. Mm. But in the moment when us girls want to talk about it, it's often no beyond point. their capacity. And so you can see how it can translate into what happens um, because that and even you know our male partners they definitely want to be able to do things that please us but generally they can do they just forget stuff particularly like bin night same night every week how can you forget i bin feel night? like you might be speaking from personal experience here maggie <laughs> if we flipped if we changed roles right now <laughs> Tell me about your so issue so with bin so night so and your husband so little things that we go like, you know, I've got a really good bloke and he's really good at cooking and putting things away. And then sometimes after he's unpacked the dishwasher, I go out and there's some saucepans that are left on the top of the bench above the drawer where it is. And I go, and then, so what I've learned is just let that go. And I want that to be something you think of with your boys at times. Is this worth a fight or do I save my, my big parental swagger for the really, really important stuff, you know, like when they hurt others or, you know, um, you know, um, what they've said um, is really inappropriate um, and it's unkind or it's cool. Do you get what I mean? I, I, yeah. I think, that, um, you know, it's again, we save it for the big stuff yeah. rather than the endless stuff. And so one of the things we know, you know, for, for, you know, we know that children feel strongly attached when they know they're loved. Well, often for females, we'll often tell them a lot because we love our words, don't we? Love, mm. love, love our words. Whereas mm. for the boys, sometimes um, the little punch on the arm, you know, the stomping on their foot, um, the ruffling of their head, the big bear hug from behind might fill them up much more than just those words because, again, they're often driven kinesthetically. And they hear endless words, so they're pretty good at zoning out. So we can do both. I think it's really, really important that not mm. to assume that they feel secure in our love. And then one of the other ones, and this one can be a bit hard. I've had mum say to me, oh, it felt like you smacked me when you said that, Maggie. Um, we think they don't notice when we get exasperated and we go, mm. or we roll our eyes a bit. But boys have told me they know that that is, they know they've let mummy down. Mm. And it like they feel the pain in their heart. Again, we just don't think they notice, but that's the stuff they can notice because they're actually quite good at nonverbal. They're just not very good at the endless verbal. Yeah. So we really have to be mindful at times that um, we're not rolling our eyes or go <sighs> yet again. Yeah. Um, and because that's the sort of stuff as females, we often do that the way that we communicate. We go, yeah. yeah, that's my main language. <laughs> Eye rolls and sarcasm. Um, I just wanted to give everyone a shout out. If you've got any questions, please pop them in the comments because we will get to them um, with Maggie. So we'd love to hear what you would like to ask her. Um, Maggie, I would like to ask you, you touched on the physical aspect. Uh, and I know, you know, that that's kind of kids' ways of, of communicating, as you said. And, you know, in the playground, it might be giving your mate a flick on the back of the leg with your jacket or a push in the back. 
but not all boys do love that. And I'm pretty sure not all siblings love that. Uh, one of the girls at work did say she's got three boys and they are so rough with each other that it usually ends up in tears. So in that instance, is it something that we, when we know that they're physical and that's how they communicate, that we should be just letting them go because that's how they're, they're communicating with each other? Or do you need to kind of set some boundaries in place so that it doesn't end up in broken arms and, you know, fat lips and everything else? Okay, so let's go back to one of the key aspects again. Um, and that is that when girls are, um, are really fond of a sibling or a friend, they often come out with those words, don't they? Who's your best? Well, what are you like? Oh, I've got that doll too. So we play together and they just do this, mm. what we call, um, you know, connectedness that's verbal. So what our boys are often doing, they use that um, antics, physical antics, um, and the shoving and the patting and the punch on the arm and, and, and that, and also the banter, which is a bit teasy. Uh, trying to make each other laugh because that's how they show their affection. Mm. They won't do that. Um, norm normally they don't do that to boys they don't particularly like. So, again, if you've got three boys, imagine I had the four. Oh, my goodness. There were times <laughs> that I would go and take a cup of tea and go outside and sit on the quiet chair out in the garden because, um, you know, every fibre of my being as a woman was saying, I need to stop this wrestling. They're always wrestling. They're always competing. It's doing my head in. Um, mm. And then I realised, you know, when I, you know, but there's a part of me that knew that underneath that they're actually having fun. So even if they jump on a brother from the top bunk, the intention to hurt is very rarely ever there. They're wanting to have fun and fun often means physicality. So it's not always, it's not always intended to hurt, but guess what? Sometimes it does. So that's when the teachable lesson comes in. And I have three basic rules that I would really, really love to have on your fridge. Try not to hurt yourself. Try not to hurt anyone else and try not to damage the world around you so that when they do cause a physical pain to another child, um, that they're able to recognise that, oh, hang on a minute, I might not have intended it, but I need to work out that that needs to come back a bit. And one of the ways mm. that boys traditionally found that out is with rough and tumble play or rough housing, depending on where you are, particularly with the dad, because while they're doing that, every now and then dad will go, no, that's too hard. So mm. they're learning the boundary around um, all of that physical answering, which is great. Um, and But there's also, we've got to be able to bring into our boys' world now um, the need for them to put clear messages up when it's too much. You know, it's a bit like this is the consent stuff. That's basically, I'm just mm. withdrawing my consent right now. So instead of yeah. punching them hard to get them off, we go, no, stop, no, stop stop no so this is something i'd love every boy to be taught you know in those very early years of life and going right the way through because um what we're finding with the teenage boys with the surges of testosterone the brain pruning which means they can't access any prefrontal lobe they're even more impulsive um and they're even more wired with the testosterone um is that they can do that and i had it in my classrooms a lot you know, they were always slapping each other and grunting on each other and grabbing each other's bum. And, you know, no matter how many thousand times you said it with that particular age group, it was just exactly how they were. But there were boys who also didn't like it. So we actually need to talk to them about this is just how you're behaving right now. But, you know, every now and then we need to say, no, it's not OK. And one of the problems, mm -hmm. I know it's a question you were going to ask me, Mel, so I might throw it in here. What has shifted is our boys are being marinated and so are many of our girls in a much more violent online world where they watch violent movies, but they're also watching pornography, which, of course, is incredibly demeaning for our girls and women and often has choking and all sorts of other stuff in there. It's often very violent. So mm -hmm. what was sort of slappy, silly stuff has actually morphed into other things, um, and I'm hearing that around school environments, that um, it is actually sexual harassment. So instead of just you know, pinging a bra strap occasionally, which even then I would have leapt on and said, that's absolutely not okay, you've crossed a line. Um, now there is groping, serious groping um, of girls. Um, and when, when a girl says, no, don't, they're going, don't be so silly. I'm just, it's mm, just it's funny. Just looking around, yeah. Yeah, well, that is the new big message for parents as their boys go onto that bridge that they we really have to step up and be these teachers around the codes and values that are now acceptable in today's world 
And even if they do watch that stuff, which of course we wish they didn't, it doesn't apply in the real world. That's a very mm -hmm. artificial world. So can you see again, it's a really big responsibility that we have that many of our boys believe that they don't need us as parents because I can learn everything online. One boy said to me, I don't need my dad to teach me how to change a tire, just Google it. And I oh. said, well, what happens if you lose your phone or you've got no <laughs> Wi-Fi or whatever? And he said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Is that a thing? <laughs> yeah. Can you see again? He's just going, oh, well, I wouldn't. And I went, yeah, but you could. Yeah. So it was about us that once again, what has always traditionally happened is that we have mentored very carefully both our girls on the journey to womanhood and and our um, basically our men on the journey to manhood. We really, really got to be able to make sure we're putting those guidance in place, uh, and it's how we do that guidance as well. We're just seeing to have lost Mel. I might just continue talking about that because there's another line around that, and that is the um, the teasing. Teasing is a way, and I'm pretty sure if you've had boys in your life or you've had men in your workplace or you've watched your beautiful man with his brother, that every now and then they do this banter and teasing and sometimes they nickname each other. Now, that is that is actually another way to show um, connection or affection. Um, and sometimes, <laughs> you know, us, we can scratch our head going, what on earth is that all about? So, again, what is kind of considered quite normal and is sometimes quite harmless in the teenage year without a good prefrontal, it can be, you know, disgusting. So what we're finding is sometimes our girls, instead of maybe a boy saying, wow, hey, hottie, well, now they might just call out things like um, ho or whore or something because they've watched porn, which they still think is the same. And it's, of course it's not. So we need to have these really, really, really big conversations about where the line in the sand is. And I go into that in enormous depth um, in the book so that we're able to start this well before they turn 12, 13 and 14. So just in case you haven't realised that the tween is anything up to 13, but puberty is definitely kicking in well before that. So again, it's about not leaving um, our boys on the bridge to manhood to chance we actually need to be the rails on the bridge again, regardless of how digitally wise they may be. We need them to be given, um, you know, loving guidance and we need to work out how do we do that loving guidance without, um, when they're not always very good at communicating. Yeah, no, we had a great question from Emma around communication a bit earlier and we were, we were talking about um, when to have those conversations with our boys, potentially about decisions that they could have made diff differently, not necessarily things they did wrong, as we just talked about that shame aspect. Um, so, I mean, in the bath or in the car, quite a good space for younger children. But what about your teens? Is it around finding something in common like their basketball or their comics or minecraft or something when when's a good time to have a conversation with a teen like that okay so they the really key aspect we know about teen boys is um um that timing of when you have the conversations particularly around some of these you know subjects um you know uh, attitudes to women or sex or whatever or their big calling um, other boys by names that are no longer appropriate in terms of you know being gay we have to have those mm. conversations and deconstruct stuff um, the very best thing is if you can always be mindful that it's not eyeball to eyeball so as soon as your teen boy sees you looking at directly at them it's threat so they've already pulled away and they've shut down so in the car is a good one and just bring it up, make sure you've got enough time in the, on the road trip Don't, and not really necessary on the way to school, possibly on the way home and drive the long way home. Just I need to bring up something. Did you did you hear this the other day? Can we just have a little chat about how, how you feel about that? So mm -hmm. once again, um, quite often it's not one chat, it's many chats. But there, when we have those chats, um, when you've had them and you've made it um, – like as um, easy to understand and not too much detail, but something, I just want you to really give that some thought. You're not necessarily what do you think, but can you give that some thought? Um, and if you've got a big thing that you want to say to them, and this is a really big thing you have to kind of like, okay, so I'm going to need to talk to you about something very important. Um, maybe we have one place that we do so that it's not around any of the other siblings. So I had a deck 
big deck out the front. So um, I'd often say, can I just have a word on the deck? And they go, oh, she wants to Here we go, a deck chat. <laughs> a deck chat. So deck chat meant I would be um, with my elbows on the deck and they would often be kind of next to me or maybe a bit further away. But the deck chat was when I needed to talk about something that was really concerning me. Now, if it was, it was something that um, could possibly, um, you know, like take a bit longer, then I know they're going to forget most of what I've just said. Mm. So that's when I started to suggesting I wrote a you wrote a mum letter. There's a special way of writing a mum letter. Um, no question, dads can have these conversations, but the way dad will do it will be quite different, and it won't be as embellished around the edges of people's feelings. Mm. You remember what we're trying to coach them now. And the mum letter will always start with something lovely and then we'll just say, this is my concern. I really think that you've got some attitudes around the way that you're speaking um, to your sister that's different to your um, brother. And I'm really concerned that that's something that we need to explore because it's not acceptable in our world. Our world, we mm -hmm. value everybody equally and everyone, all that sort of thing. Um, and be really specific. Um, again, it's, it's said with great love. I just need you to be aware of it. And at the bottom, just telling me love them more than all the stars and the night sky and or whatever it is. What we find is they need to read it over and over again when it's a big issue because they forget the verbal word. Mm. And um, often it's that it's that pondering on it really deeply, which actually changes from within. In other words, they're reviewing. Remember, they're actually, they really need to think about it. It's, again, a bit like growling at them immediately after the event. They've got to ponder on it and they've got to go back and see if that the way they've interpreted it is exactly as you had it. Mm. yeah you don't, you don't write too many of them you save them for the big stuff yeah and um you, I quite often didn't write mum letters to my lamb boys because they weren't pushing the boundaries and you know the things that I was really <laughs> trying to put in with my rooster boys who were wanting to chest bang and sometimes were a little bit sexist and racist and I just was really wanting to jump on that mm. in a way make it confrontational and then the other part to it is make sure every now and then you pick up something that's on the TV, watch a film together and go, whoa, did you see that? Mm. Conversation about that in amongst this. Mm. So it's a kind of incidental conversation. Yeah, and then nice. that's, it's a It's a very important thing. And then the other part to communicating with your boys is that um, your timing again. Um, if they've just got out of bed, no, nah, they're just not on the same planet. If they're eating, no. Nah. If they've got their phone in their hand, no. Nah. Not after school, no. Nah. If they've got exams, no. Nah. So you've really got to pick. You have time left. <laughs> yeah, there is. No, no, eating and sleeping in their no, You really, really will get good at picking those moments because what we want them to do is to feel that we really are their coach, you know, that we have got, we've got their back, but we're doing it with incredible compassion because we want them to grow up to be that happy, healthy man. You know, we don't want we don't want to raise our sons to be creeps, uh, sexual predators, or capable of murdering um, women and children. You know, put that in if you have to, because they can see examples of that. And many of the boys say that you know that whole toxic masculinity, all the kind of media portrays is the worst versions of men. So mm -hmm. our job as, as parents is to marinate them in all the versions of good men. And there are endless stories out there, but it's just not what sells media at the moment. So mm. finding stories, and you can find it online, sometimes it's in the socials, and really sharing those, showing examples of men who have got integrity and character um, and let them and, and let them start to see that. Then we start to be able to transform a, um, an accepted version that this is just who would want to grow up to be a man if most of them are, you know, awful like that because mm. it's not true. And it yeah. is kind of like we have to correct that perception as well because, like I said, there are so many good men in our world who um, would never do any of those things. Mm. You're absolutely right and it's so true. That's why we're all here is to raise those that next generation of kind, respectful men. I do want to touch on the lamb and the rooster in a little bit because I have a fabulous story that you told me recently. But we do have a question from Carmen, which is something I did want to come back to, which is around you were talking about emotions and feelings and how we can try and not parent that out of our kids. Uh, so Carmen is asking how can we help the little ones before they enter that stage, help identify their feelings, particularly around anger and frustration and, and sadness. 
particularly if we've been pushed to the edge, because I know we've all been there and I've done it. You try and try and try, but small kids in particular do push buttons that you didn't even know you had. So, you know, if, if I honestly have found myself saying, stop yelling as I'm yelling. And in your mind, you're just like, I completely know that this is totally counterproductive. Yeah. What can we do? Help us. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, one of the things, if you can keep, it's like being a CSI detective. You've actually just got to keep a little bit of tab on the level of voice around the home because we know when they're starting to escalate, yeah? So one of the things, and I wasn't, I couldn't even remember my boys doing it. I'm sure they did. So um, my little uh, four-year-old grandson now is only just coming out the tail end of his screaming. So when his sister annoyed him, uh, he didn't get what he wanted. It was this piercing scream mm -hmm. and I'm going to tell you that um, that's also because they're not as verbal as girls but it is that frustration is coming and it floods so cortisol floods and it feels awful so to get it rid sounds of them, awful too my son's done that oh, oh, it's piercing <laughs> like really piercing is mm -hmm. um again knowing they're trying to discharge it they cannot hear you once they're flooded which will save our voice, won't it, really? Um, so there's a couple of different ways of doing that. It's just if you can get in before it goes to the high level of screaming or whatever, is, wow, buddy, you look like you're having a really tough time right now. Can I, can I, can mummy help? Um, but validating, oh, yeah, I can hear that. You really are struggling. Is that frustrated and angry? So I'm trying to get into, a, a, you know, associate those big feelings with some form of emotion. Um, and at that point, I would stay somewhere nearby um, to make sure that he doesn't rip his sister apart or trash whatever he's got nearby or physically hurt himself. But again, not too close. If you get too close to boys escalating, you re-escalate them. Mm. So it's staying not far away and knowing that once it's tipped, really, we don't actually need to do anything. I know it sounds crazy, but we have to let it discharge out. So once it discharges out, you'll tend to find it goes from mad and crazy and you've discharged the cortisol and guess what happens? You'll start to, they can start activating the serotonin, which means you'll see that they de-escalate. So they often need us to just be around about to bring them back down again. Now, one other way that my um, one of my sons has done it with this little lad is when he's gone into that space because he's bigger and he's just dad, because dads can do things a little differently. He just scoops him up and says, hey, mate, we're going outside. Let's go outside for a while. He just scoops him up and wanders outside with him, not saying a word about whatever it was, not, not trying to soothe him. He just scoops him up with his beautiful big arms around him, takes him outside in the fresh air, and they just go for a little walk around the garden. Yeah? Nice. Yeah. Again, and that's not the point, of course, if we're getting frustrated, one of the things I'd love you to get used to in, in front of our boys and our girls is every now and then, mummy's really getting stressed. If you get in quick enough, mummy's getting really stressed. I'm just going to take myself in the bedroom because I need to calm down for a moment. I'll be back really quick. And hopefully you've got hidden in your wardrobe a really beautiful big block of fruit and nut chocolate because to me that's... <laughs> I thought you were going to say a really big bottle of wine. <laughs> no, no, the chocolate. It, it, chocolate's much bigger. <laughs> Um, and then that can reset all your serotonin, but you're regrouping. So what you're modelling to your son and your or your daughter mm. is every now Rowan ups can get really stressed and they can be shouty and yelly. They're not bad, but they have to take action as well. So yeah. another thing that I you know I do suggest around homes is having a a resting chair or a calming chair. And from time to time. Um, you model it, um, you know, whoever you're co-parenting with, just have a time in the chair and the kids go, what are you doing? So I'm just getting a little bit cross and I've had a really, really hard day at work and so I'm just sitting here to to bring myself down. And if you model it, mm. you know it your, your children, particularly your boys, will in, be in that chair giving themselves a bit of time out. So, again, rather than endlessly telling them what's going on and telling them what to do, if we model it, we're showing it again and quite often that's often what they need to see because the mirror neurons in the brain can see that and start doing it. Yeah, leading by example. I do want to come back to that lamb and rooster aspect. You were talking yeah, about yeah. having some time out and I love a story that you told me about one of your boy lambs who recognised that when you needed some time out, some time to yourself, you went and had a bath. 
uh, and then one day he did bring you in a cup of tea and, and boys kind of, I know it's a generalisation, but do sort of seem to fall into one camp or the other. We do have a question from Daniel who wanted to know, um, is there such a thing as being too sensitive with your boys? And actually, this is something that I've thought about before. You know, is it possible to, I guess, kind of over, um, not mollycoddle, I don't really like that word, but sometimes I'm so conscious of being, you know, what are you feeling right now? I understand that you're you're feeling frustrated or you're feeling sad. You know, what, what do you think you could do next time? Um, and then every now and then I sort of think, well, is this the right thing or do you actually need a boundary right now? Do you need a little bit of firmer guidance, I guess, with the decisions that you're making? So, yeah, is there such a thing as being too sensitive with boys? I'm going to tell you absolutely not. However, um, and that's that boundary bit again. Remember the boundaries are in place so our children know that their behaviour can go to a certain point. Your sensitive lambs very rarely want to push past that. If you yeah. say no to the biscuit, they'll often just go, oh, okay, no, they're done. They're mm -hmm. not the feisties, they're not the alphas, they're not the push, 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 they're not the I'm really the most important person in this house. So I would say no. Um, what we tend to find, so two of my lambs, one of them now argues that he's transformed into a rooster. Uh, however, he's he's still very much a lamb who's quite confident and strong. And so has the other. And I think it's that thing when I'm talking about temperament again, that our job is to get them into the middle of the temperament um, spectrum. Because what we want is we want our lambs to realise at times they do need to be assertive and they mm. do need to stand up for themselves However, don't start trying to do that when they're under five. It's just so young. I can't believe sometimes the expectations we have of little boys. It's mm. a gradual thing. Um, and it is those conversations. But also if they have a rooster in their house, whether it's a girl or a boy, they are already being shown how to step up because that's how Mother Nature does it. So every now and mm. then your, <laughs> your rooster children will be sorting out your lamb and giving them a bit of toughen up. But also that beautiful lamb every now and then is, is softening off our roosters. So again, being able to know that they have that empathy and that compassion. Um, and it is much easier for our lamb boys to have it. However, we can build it into our rooster boys. And I guess that's that thing in the world. One of the things that's a big message in the book um, is that it's equally valid to be a sensitive gentleman who's not into sport, not into competition, not into being a loud mouth or a show off. They are equally valid as men in today's world. Whereas before, of course, um, you, you know, basically you need to toughen up and you need to be stoic because, you know, this is what men are like. Um, we know that it's still okay to be a strong, feisty, competitive man, but you'll notice um, in a lot of our sporting events now that those men now are shedding tears when they win or they're injured. So I, you can see the softening that is already happening. Um, and I'm, that's what we want our boys to see. We want, we want them to see grown men make mistakes, become accountable, you know, apologise and make it right, and then step back up to being someone we can accept and respect. These are the endless lessons that um, are really going to help all of us raise our children to be whoever they're meant to be. And uh, I know, um, we, you know, we've been speaking about lambs and roosters. We've got a good question here from Kelly, who said, how do we encourage our lamb boys who are by temperament cautious and sensitive to be a bit more physical? So I guess that comes back to how you were saying, we're sort of aiming for somewhere in the middle. So can you make a lamb more of a rooster and a rooster more of a lamb? And, and how do we go about that? Okay, so what Mother Nature created was really um, the best environment for our children to develop the capacities they don't have is through play with multi-age children, especially ones they're fairly familiar with. So, of course, um, this is not easy in today's world because we're not always close to our families. We're not having as many children. You don't have as many cousins. Mm, <laughs> so you don't have that village, yeah. 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 So that kind of a village environment, what it is, is our sensitive children need to, when they're playing, and, and what we've, we've been encouraging this um, um, in, in a lot of my work is um, creating an afternoon after school where you collect your kids with a bunch of your girlfriends or mates or dads or whatever, grab a coffee, and you all end up in the same park. 
So what is in that park environment is a group of grown-ups who are actually already know each other, but they all know all the children and all the children are mixing with multi-age children in that playground on play equipment they're fairly familiar with because what we know is children will copy other children who are older and it's one of my kind of gripes I think is we keep putting kids into boxes of same age children and in actual fact they there are children who are now rooster children who are actually helping sensitive children who are older than them and the reverse we watch so again anywhere you get an opportunity and I think we've got to turn around now and say look what's happening in some of our neighborhoods as a consequence of the pandemic we mm. have found that we've that parents have found and kids have found, gosh, we've got kids in our neighbourhood we didn't know who were kind of here. Mm. And again, and then we're letting those kids hang over. Instead of a play date, it's kind of like it's our house on Thursday, everyone over. And what you're not only building is authentic relationships, you are building the best environment for our children, particularly our sensitive children. Before you know it, play will take them into the space of stretching and growing like nothing else will. So play, play, play. Back to sort of our childhoods, isn't it? Um, you know, you spoke about, um, we touched on toxic masculinity and, um, you know, making sure as parents we're highlighting other men who are doing kind and amazing and respectful things. And you spoke about athletes and, and people in the public eye who are showing more emotions. How important are role models um, for children because we had a single mother earlier post a comment um, about how she she just bought your new book and and she's been reading it for her boys and I know as a single parent myself it's something that I've thought about you know is it that they need one you know male role model that's in the house to help guide them or can it be a neighbor or a grandfather or an older kid across the road all of the above, yeah. Okay, so one of the really interesting surprises in the survey that I did for the men, which was only 1,700, was who was the most significant person who helped you on the bridge to manhood on those bumpy years? 56% said their mum. So even really? Yes, exactly. So even though they're on this journey to manhood, who's the safe base I'm going to fall on when I muck up? Who's mm. the person kind of be able to you know let me have a cry in the dark when I've mucked up or failed my exam or crashed the car um, <clears throat> so what we also oh God, know no. <laughs> no, <they're not. laughs> so what what we do know from that is that um boys um are, are looking all the time outward in the world for growing ups not just men but also significant growing ups they'd like to be a bit like so, of course, we've got those in our school systems and I call them significant adult allies who aren't mum and dad because, of course, they push back mum and dad in the adolescent window, both girls and boys. So the lighthouse figures are, can be the neighbour. They can be an uncle. They can be a grandparent. Um, really interesting, the boys survey that we did, which was kind of like nearly 900 beautiful boys, 12 to 18, um, who was their most significant lighthouse figure at the moment? And nearly 25% said their grandparents. So I'm really happy about that one. <laughs> well, they weren't quite as high um, back then because it was more coaches and teachers and music teachers. And so again, every now and then what I have to keep reminding um, solo mums partic particularly is that you can raise awesome boys. There's absolutely no question because you've got more time and energy to invest in the emotional coaching so they're going to be used to being in a home with a woman, seriously. Yep. Secondly, um, that while they're out there looking, um, it, they can run into men that actually just say hello to them. And that is what we call shining a light into their dark world. So just continually, even if their hair is down over their eyes and they're not really answering back, making sure that we shine what I call a, an invisible light onto the invisible sign around a teen boy's neck that says, make me feel I matter. Every one of us oh. can do that. And every one of us needs to step up now because we, all of our kids are, are struggling in our world. We know the statistics are scary for both our boys and girls in the teen window. And a part of it is, you know, we've got a bigger disconnect. You know, the social capital of our world needs to be reignited again. Um, and I'll tell a quick story of a boy who I was counselling for uh, chronic homesickness. Um, he'd gone off to boarding school and um, which I really need to reframe that because it's chronic grief. 
it's actually grief because you, you're processing major loss, your home, your environment, your bedroom, your mm-hmm. mum's cooking, your dog, your community. You're missing everything. So it's actually grief. It's not homesickness. Anyway, when he went home and he got back and he contacted me and said, oh, he said, I want to tell you something that happened. He said when he went home, he went into the newsagent in his um, country town and the newsagent guy um, called him out, said, oh, how you doing? God, I'm, your mum told me about that. You went there and, you, gosh, I think you've grown and you you're looking so much bigger and stronger. Great to see you. And he apparently just um, sent me the message and said, I thought they would all forget me. Oh, bless him. Can be the shop assistant, can be the person at the pool, can be, it's about saying hello. It's about seeing them when they kind of are at war with themselves. So it's big stuff and little stuff and they're everywhere around, but we have to call them up now. And it all matters. I love that. Got to try and remember that little invisible sign. Um, I know we are reaching an hour of your time, Maggie. We do have a quick question from Joe, um, who his poor thing is in an all boy household, which I think you know a lot about. Uh, and sounds like poor Joe is going a little bit mad uh, with two teen boys, a tween, and a forty-year-old boy in her household. That is a lot of boy in one house. Any advice? Oh, where's her quiet chair in the garden is the first yeah. thing. <laughs> Next to the also, block of chocolate. Yeah, and I also used to escape sometimes because, as you mentioned before, um, escaping for a bath and locking the door and lighting candles and putting my essences on and putting some music on um, seriously was me restoring my serotonin levels. I ignored the notes posted under the door, but I needed them to know there were times that I needed a break from them because they were doing my head in. Um, and that I love them, but I need a break. I'll be back shortly. And they always knew I was much nicer when I came out. Um, but also I think at times, um, what are you doing um, for you? Yeah, are you making sure you're getting enough female time? So for me, uh, all boy house, um, I used to run women's retreats um, once a year. It was quite funny, or, or I'd run shorter ones. And the reason was I needed to be immersed in female stuff every now and then. And the boys mm. would even say to me in their teenage years, is there another retreat coming? And that meant that I was obviously <laughs> narky. Yeah, yeah like, you oh, needed a break. I, I needed a break. Yeah. And then the other part of this is our job, um, particularly as mamas, is to make sure no matter how noisy, crazy and, and boy-like they are, that they are stepping up and taking responsibility to be part of the team family, that they are doing their chores, that they are learning how to make their bed, they are learning how to do washing, and that that is a big job for the 40 year old in the house and yourself that they are still having to be responsible for one of the things we know that demotivates boys is when mums keep doing stuff for them because they Mm. think oh I can't do it we have to step up because this is that call you know in a few more years you're going to grow up to be a man and my job is to make sure you're a really capable young man no you're not negotiable but there are mm. times and ways that we can get them to do those things so that they learn how to exist within a system that is called a family, that they need to know. There are times that making your mum a cup of tea or a cup of coffee uh, without getting anything for it is a really smart thing to do. And it's yeah. still okay for them to bring the washing off the line with the pegs on, but <laughs> that is still their job. Absolutely. Um, I know one of the final chapters in your book as we come to the end of our chat is heartbreakingly called Letting Go. Uh, And I know that uh, Mia Friedman wrote, I think last year about being the mum of a boy is kind of like someone slowly breaking up with you. And even though mine is only five, I still look at his little face every time he gives me a kiss in the morning and tells me he loves me. And I just picture, I can already picture it, just having to gradually let him go. I can't believe I'm asking you this, Maggie, but how do we let them go? How do we, how do we put all this work in to build these beautiful, kind, respectful men, which I know all of the boys of the mums and dads listening are going to be? How do we finally let them go? All right. So if I let you into a secret, this is the secret because I I'm really I won't tell cold. anybody else. It's just you no, and me. No, none of you. <laughs> <laughs> is that um, when we are able to let them go, when we're able to let them walk out that door at times without reminding them of their jumper and their shirt and, and, and have they got this and have they done that, when we let them go, um, really let them go, yes, 
if, if you've got lambs, oh gosh, I, I cried for months. The roosters, I just was really glad. See you, yeah, later. See you later. Love you. Yeah, bye. Um, but what I'm going to tell you is that when you let them go, and yes, you know, as I said, it is probably um, the longest breakup you can ever experience. If you truly let them go, they, um, they need to become their own individual human being. They cannot do that under our wing, particularly us as mothers. And so when we do that, we give them the greatest gift we can ever give them. And that is the gift of their own self. And what happens then is you know that they are going to, at some point, co-partner, because that's how Mother Nature intended everything to be. And um, that you're, the moment that you meet your son first as a man, you'll know it the day that he walks in and he's a man. There's just this huge shift and you look up and go, whoa. Oh, you're um, bringing a tear to my eye. I'm honestly like. Well, we'll cry then, but that gets worse and the, even better, the better, the moment that your son comes to you with his firstborn child to show mm. it to you as a mother is the greatest, greatest moment. Um, so you don't technically lose him. Comes back. <laughs> Always, like I said, your capacity to love him unconditionally and fiercely while he's going through all this incredible bumpiness will be rewarded. So just keep in mind tenderness, kindness and compassion is what every one of our teens need, girls and boys. They do not need us to be the growly bums in the world because the world is already full of that and they're already being too hard on themselves. Maggie, as always, I love your no nonsense, but um, practical and thoughtful and um, empathetic advice. And I think there are so many wonderful take homes there from everybody watching. But even more importantly, there are so many incredible lessons and practical advice in your fantastic book, which is an absolute must buy for anybody with boys um please get out there get yourself a copy it's called from boys to men wherever you get your good books um so much amazing feedback coming in from people who've been watching for the last hour uh you absolutely love everything that you've brought to us and i'm so grateful that we have someone like you who is helping try to guide us um, create this a better future for everybody because I just to think of a world where we're surrounded by these men who are in touch with their feelings and yeah. who can be strong when we need them to be but also can be tender when we need is just a world that I can't wait to see so yeah. thank you once that again the world. thank you Maggie, so much yes. Absolutely. Love chatting to you. Thanks everyone for watching. Make sure you head out, grab a copy of Maggie's book uh, from Boys to Men and all of her other fantastic references. But this one is a brilliant read. Uh, trying to ignore the last chapter about letting go, putting that off for another 13 years, hopefully. Um, but Maggie, thanks. Thank you once again for joining us with you.